Earlier this year, uh, well, Columbus is blessed to have Mary Mines researching land use and housing policy and development program. Earlier this year, the city council reached out to the Ohio State Department of Community Land Trust. I'm so glad that this graduate class was interested in investigating best practices and share their thoughts today. As everyone in this room knows, Columbus has a substantial deficit of affordable Maintain long-term housing affordability for neighborhoods. But while we can all agree that a community land trust is a good idea, what does it look like? How is it financed? What's the decision-making structure? Are all questions that must be addressed? There are lots of important details that folks from around Franklin County have been digging into. Today, we will hear presentations from three OSU teams outlining three different land trust models. Housing Chair, Councilmember Jaiza Page, President Pro Tem Cindiano, Councilmember Mitch Brown, and Councilmember Priscilla Tyson. We're also happy to have Hope Kingsborough from the Central Ohio Community Improvement Corporation, otherwise known as COSIC. Uh, and then finally on the panel is Professor Jason Reese, uh, who uh, has helped lead this class along with his co Professor Bernadette Henry. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, first, I would like to, to ask if any customers have anything like that to add? Yeah. Uh, anything for the panelists before we get started? All right. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our students for their presentations. All right, we're going first over here. So my name is Molly Martin. I'm Richard Hansen. I'm Greg Gauss. I'm Nicholas Julian. And I'm Stephanie Yu. Um, and we researched the neighborhood level land trust uh, concept and specifically looked at it in relation to Columbus and if this would be a good fit. And so first we thought that we would address why Columbus is needed for a land trust model. And as we looked more into it and as you look at Columbus, you see, if you look at the third slide in our presentation, that over time we have a lot of neighborhoods in Columbus that are seeing a lot of economic growth. They're seeing a lot of development. And because of that, there's a lot of cool things happening. Like if you look at the short north, even 10 years ago, it was very different. But because of the growth that's happening and because there isn't a neighborhood stabilization model put in place yet, you see a lot of people who are being priced out of their homes and they have to move. And so we looked specifically kind of at Franklinton and Linden, which are two of the communities that are kind of up and coming in Columbus right now, and especially Franklinton, which is doubling in home price like every six months. Um, and so we think that the neighborhood land trust model could be a really good and useful tool in creating neighborhood stabilization in these communities so that there can still be economic benefit, there can still be development, but you're not just kicking everybody out who's currently living there. And so Community Land Trust, just kind of in summary, is an organization that purchases land and oftentimes has a home on it um, or another type of building. And the Community Land Trust will continue to own the land that the house is on, but they will sell the building to um, a new owner and they will lease the land from the community land trust and what this does is allows the community land trust to um, regulate how much the home is resold for and so this really stretches city dollars because instead of putting a ton of money into one home that then a decade later is resold at market value and is no longer an affordable home this allows for one home to stay the city dollars that go into this home create um, an affordable house that goes on for generations. And so there's different financing models that we looked into for how you can fund this. And there's a nice little graphic um, that Stephanie made for us. And so this is, there's forgiveness, recapture, and retention. And as we looked into this, we found that most community land trusts use the retention model. 
So forgiveness is basically every single time you buy a home or that that home is resold, you sell it for market value. And then the land trust has to make up the difference to make the house affordable. So in this model, every single time the home is resold, the land trust has to fork forward money. So we didn't find anybody who used that model. <laughs> um, the recapture model uh, sells it for a little bit above affordability and the land trust has to put in some money, but then it's able to recapture some of the value and put it back into the home. But what most of the land trusts use that we saw was the retention model. And this is literally just having some type of calculation that says what is affordable in this current economic base in this neighborhood and we're just gonna keep reselling homes at the affordable level. And so the money is just kept within the home instead of having to fork up money every single time you resell. And so the next question becomes why do this on a neighborhood level? Because you can do this at very different sizes. And we found that as we were doing research, most of the CLTs or the community land trusts are doing this on a neighborhood level. And so why is that? And we think that it is because there's greater community knowledge and buy-in. If you have someone who says, let's improve our community, we're gonna do this so that we can build up where we live, you can get a lot more community members involved in that way. And we also found that there's a larger local and neighborhood impact because instead of looking at a very large scale, let's put a house here and let's put a house here and let's put a house here, you can have a land trust that's focused in on one community and says, okay, we're gonna, we know that this area is really bad. This is where a lot of crime happens. And so we really wanna improve this specific street. Um, and so you can get a lot more local um, specific help in that way. And then also we found that this model is more adaptable. So if you have a community like Franklinton that's literally like every month the home value is going up and up and up and up, you know, okay, I need to buy land really fast. I need to get in there. Whereas there might be another community like North Linden where home values are going up, but you have a little bit more thinking time, you have a little more wiggle room. And so on a neighborhood level, you can adapt specifically to each neighborhood and what that community needs. And so then based some of our research, we reached out to a lot of different land trusts across the US. So if you look on the next slide, you'll see some of the organizations that we consulted. Um, so we emailed them, talked with them on the phone, had a couple in-person conversations as well. And some of the main findings we've had were when and how do you acquire land? And do you rehab buildings or do you build new homes for a land trust? And so first with land acquisition, we found over and over and over again, buy as fast as you can. <laughs> um, especially in neighborhoods that are flipping or gentrifying you need to buy land or homes while they're as cheap as possible. And the advice that we got was, even if you don't have a specific plan, like you know that you're going to do a community land trust, even if you don't have every single step planned out, while it's cheap, go in and grab it, because otherwise it doesn't, it's not a affordable economic model, so. And then the choice between rehabbing or new builds is predominantly dependent on what's available. So if you have a lot of properties that <clears throat> rehabbing is uh, a viable option, we would absolutely suggest that, but we would also suggest new builds if um, rehabbing is too expensive. Mm -hmm. And then finally there's, well not finally, but there's some challenges and opportunities. So like I said before, some of the opportunities are like greater community involvement. Um, you can work on a deeper level in a community. You have enhanced local support, but there also are challenges with community land trust. So one um, point that we talked with several people about was startup versus ongoing challenges. So these will vary very differently. And so startup challenges could include where does our funding come from? How do we get into a community? How do we get people excited? Do we start with an organization that already exists? Do we make a new organization? Um, whereas ongoing challenges can be more, okay, how far do we want to expand? How many homes do we want to be able to provide? And then we also have saw that there's developer competition. So if you look at Franklinton as an example again, land is going like really fast because developers are going in, they know it's cheap, they know they can make a lot of profit. And so we found that 
community land trusts often can have this type of competition with developers. And so one of the things that we suggest is being able to use the skills and resources that developers have instead of competing with them, figuring out how to partner with developers um, so that they can actually help with uh, making community land trusts instead of constantly competing with them for land and resources. Another challenge would be finding the right pricing model for these homes. Um, so there's quite a few different options, and these can be adapted over time as you go to resell properties, um, and they can also be different dependent on neighborhoods. So that's one benefit of the neighborhood model is that you can have unique pricing models for each of the neighborhoods. Um, from our case studies and our research, we found that basing pricing models off of area media income is not always the best because it has inefficiencies when you're looking at maintaining affordability on a long term. Um, so we would suggest that we use an appraisal based model uh, that can be then adapted for each neighborhood. So looking at how a community land trust would fit into Columbus, there's two options when you're starting a community land trust. You can either build off of existing organizations or you can start off fresh. Looking at these two, we have compared um, some of the options there, and we think that existing organizations do have more benefits. However, um, with existing organizations, there is a capacity issue because they do have existing issues, they do have existing focuses, and so it might take away from that, they might not have the staffing. So that's where a new organization would be appealing as it would be singularly uh, focused. And then looking at the organizational structure, after reviewing our case studies and looking at Columbus as its own entity, we would suggest a hybrid form where we have an entity from the city of Columbus that would oversee the various CLTs that would pop up throughout Columbus. So we think that Columbus has a lot of different neighborhoods that have a lot of unique attributes. And so having different neighborhood uh, community land trusts would be beneficial in that aspect, but there might be competition between them. So having some sort of oversight from the city, whether it be a whole office or be a singular employee, would allow to decrease that competition. It would allow for um, oversight, advisement, uh, mentoring, and it could possibly even have an endowment for these communities. So looking at funding opportunities a little closer, common sources include grants, foundations, donations, and endowments. Uh, 501c3 bonds would provide useful capital with low interest rates for qualifying nonprofits, and then a great source, initial source of income could be from the Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority. Looking at potential partners, we focused on big philanthropic organizations such as uh, Habitat for Humanity and the United Way, but we also wanted to focus on the businesses coming into these communities. So specifically in Franklin 10, we have Land Grant, BrewDog, other businesses that come in and they could partner with the community land trust as to provide funds and ultimately ensure that their presence in the community isn't removing the presence of those who already live there and would ultimately help stabilize the neighborhoods through partnership. So lastly, our recommendations. We believe that this is a great time for a community land trust in Columbus, um, especially due to the low property uh, prices in the neighborhoods that we're looking at and the high developer interest in these neighborhoods as well. Um, if done correctly, CLT, CLTs can serve as a great tool for neighborhood stabilization. And personally, we are very excited to see what the city does with this opportunity. Um, so with that, we have our whole team here to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, neighborhood group. Uh, before we start questions, and I apologize, we didn't do this at the onset of your presentation. Would you introduce the members of your team? Remind me, just so we can know who to ask questions. I'm Greg Gauss. I'm Richard Hansen. I'm Amalia Martin. I'm Nicholas Julian. I'm Stephanie Yu. Thank you so much. 
Um, I'm just going to open it up for questions. Thank you, Council President. Appreciate uh, the presentation. One thing I was curious about, when you met with the organizations, when these were established, were they organic, so kind of driven by the neighborhood, or was it something the city was looking for solutions and kind of trickled it down? I know you proposed the hybrid model, but in some of the work that we've done or what we've heard, it's been a little bit more organic, and mm -hmm. so just curious what you heard from the organizations that you talked to. Yeah, so most of the organizations we talked to were very organic, which is one of the reasons why we think the neighborhood model works so well is because it's grassroots, it's coming up from a community that wants to have stabilization, they want to keep people there. So yeah, a lot of it was organic. We think that the city oversight and funding could be really beneficial for competition, any competition that could arise. We spoke with someone in Boston, um, and they have one of the best community land trust in the US. It's called the Dudley Street Initiative. And he was saying that since they began, there have been like three or four other land trusts that have popped up. And when you have the same model in one city, they can often compete for the same funds. And so one of the ideas that they were throwing around is how do we have some type of oversight that's occurring that helps mentor, that helps share ideas, that helps uh, search for funding, give funding potentially, to various community land trusts, because that's a good problem to have, <laughs> too many community land trusts. Um, and so one of the thoughts we had as we spoke with him and a couple other people was, all right, if you have someone in the city, they could look over um, these different, or different community land trusts and see like what's going on, how can we help each of them. Um, but this also could be a non-government entity that could just be like a network that's also helping, but some type of oversight could be beneficial. Has there been any, been any thought to just geographically how you define the neighborhood land trust? As you stated, Columbus has a lot of different neighborhoods who are very unique in that. How would you not have overlap and try to avoid some of the areas of competition? I would say when we started this project, we just had Linden and Franklinton in mind. Um, I suppose that poses a good question because Definitely, as Molly was saying, the competition between multiple land trusts in one neighborhood could get effectively not efficient a model. Um, that it would be something to research further, I believe. And that could potentially be the role of the city to define boundaries or just work as they organically pop up. If we see that they're within a five mile radius of each other, you could define or maybe just sit down with the two community land trusts and say, we see that you're near each other and we love that we're pro providing so many opportunities. We want to make sure that they are quality opportunities. So how can we define this? Yeah. I think also, if you think so, West Franklinton and East Hilltop, some of that can bleed over what community am I in. I guess there's a um, And so I think if you had, all right, on one street, you know, Hilltop CLT is buying one house and Franklinton CLT is buying another, I don't know that that would really generate too much of an issue. It's still providing two affordable homes. Um, depends how much money we get. But yes, it depends how much money they have and how many other funds they can get. Um, because the city will provide some funds. If they're partnering with other organizations, they have other funds. So I think money would be the biggest competition, but in terms of like having two community land trusts that have homes on the same street, I don't think that that would necessarily be like a competition type of thing. I have two questions. The first question is you mentioned that that Boston really has a premier land trust program. And for the viewing and listening audience, and obviously for those of us who are sitting at this table, can you share with us and share with the community? Because I don't, you know, one, I don't know if the community really understands what a land trust does and how important it can be. So could you just share one, an example of what happened in Boston and what could happen in Columbus should we uh, engage in a model like this? Yeah, so the Dudley Street Initiative Land Trust, they had a community that had a ton of vacant land, just abandoned homes, and they kept coming to the city, what are you going to do, what are you going to do, and eventually the city just gave them all the land bank uh, land that they had. This is just how they did it. Um, and so what they began to do is build homes. Theirs are mostly new builds instead of rehabs. And through building these homes, 
um, the neighborhood quality increased because there's not just vacant and abandoned homes everywhere. And then they began to sell the homes. And what they saw was there was an increase in um, like stabilizing the neighborhood. So there was a lot more um, residents who were able to stay there long term, a lot less in and out. Um, there was also a lot more care for the homes that were there. There was also an increase in having time to read to their children and school attendance um, because there was a lot more stabilization. So there's other community benefits. And I think one of the things that worked really well with um, the Boston this Boston example is they also had on their community land trust properties, they had gardens. Um, they're just now starting to have retail space. And I'm not exactly sure how, they're still trying to figure out the um, kinks with that, but they're gonna have um, a revenue from that because they'll lease out some of the retail space. Uh, and they also have community playgrounds on their land. And so because they own all this land, they're able to make sure that community has the resources that they need. It's not just, oh, it's providing housing. And can you share, we talk about affordability, and I know mm -hmm. it's Boston. About, you know, who neighborhoods. So what would be the affordability factor within that community? Yeah, so that's another reason we think the neighborhood level works, because affordability from neighborhood to neighborhood is different. <laughs> um, and so, like Richard was saying earlier, there was a, there is a um, area median income model that a lot of land trusts have found doesn't work well because as a community goes up and up, the area income, med median income goes up and up. And so then you're really still pricing people out um, if you base the home value on that. And so we saw a lot of different models for how you can calculate this. Um, if you want to talk about the appraisal. Yeah, so with the appraisal model, they appraise the home to see how much it's um, worth at market rate. And then from there, and this could be tailored to any specific community, but with our example in Yellow Springs, just down the road, they did it at two thirds. And so they took two thirds of the appraised price and that was the selling price for the home at an affordable rate. Now looking at Yellow Springs as a case study, that's still gonna be a little higher than um, what we might be targeting in these areas, uh, but that's where the uniqueness from the neighborhood model would come into play so that we're making sure that whatever number we need for the threshold of um, communities or families that are needing to find homes that we're meeting that rate of what the market is for them. The, I guess the one question that I would have would be, are, have any of the models that you uh, studied for the neighborhood-based uh, land trust, did they build in any other factors to community stabilization? I think about a program that Councilmember Page uh, started uh, where uh, we, we incentivize folks working with um, young people um, or restored citizens. Uh, has, has that been built into any uh, models or anything similar? Um, so, somewhat. I think some of the different land trusts had programs that you could have that made sure that you knew specifically how to take care of your home. So there's a lot, most of them had a program of how do you um, afford your home, how do you keep it up, how do you maintain it. Some of them required monthly classes. Um, and so there was a lot of focus on that, obviously because it's a home ownership program. Um, but there also were I think some programs that had um, more community involvement, there was a lot of like, okay, we're gonna bring the community together to make this garden that we're all gonna benefit from or different things like that, that the land trust organized. Um, so I don't know if it was as kind of systematic as, okay, we're gonna bring in you know, people who need rehabilitated or something like that, but there is a lot of uh, community organized community work within that area. Got it. Yep. I just wanted to add, I believe in the San Francisco Land Trust, they, which was unique to them, they actually charged their homeowners or tenants membership dues, and I believe with those dues you got financial literacy classes and things mm -hmm. like that, I believe. 
And then on the same note, there is opportunity to do the um, same model with commercial properties so that you are keeping commercial properties affordable so businesses such as that can stay in the neighborhood as well. Thank you. You mentioned Boston and San Francisco. What other cities did you look at uh, with regards to a, uh, a land bank? Well, some was and that's within the state. We also looked at Los Angeles. We spoke with um, a member of the uh, Wideland community? Oh. Essentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Minneapolis? We have, um, we have a report we'd like to hand out that has more details. Well, Our yeah. exact contacts. Thank you so much. Just so we can keep uh, on time, I want to go ahead and move to the uh, regional group. Is that the order? But just joking. We're going to go city first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, I'm Jimmy Hopple, and along with a few of my other group members, we'll be presenting a community land trust model through the lens of a citywide approach. Um, we will be starting with a brief introduction and a background of the current condition of Columbus, then providing an overview of a few case studies that we researched, and we will end with some key takeaways and recommendations. Uh, the purpose of this study was to equip city council with a framework for creating a citywide community land trust uh, which preserves affordable home ownership in, in and around Columbus. Anyone familiar with Columbus is aware of the population growth that has occurred and is expected to continue. This growth has led to shifting of investment and revitalization of particular areas, oftentimes uh, resulting in the displacement of low-income residents. This reveals a problem and a need to protect affordable housing, of which Columbus is already lacking 54,000 needed units. We are aware the city's initial in interest focus areas of Linden and Franklinton and, and the hope to protect affordability and increase the quality of life for the current residents. Uh, but we wanted to look at how data can inform us about the current condition of Columbus uh, and what it can suggest about how a citywide land trust uh, could be employed. So this first map that you're going to look at is a heat map of 2018 property values around Columbus. As you can see, the highest relative property values uh, generally follow and radiate from High Street, uh, including neighborhoods like Clintonville, the Short North, and German Village. Uh, we also see a pocket of higher property values in the Westgate area on the west side. Uh, understanding property value can suggest what areas might already be unaffordable for a CLT to purchase land, but can also suggest where opportunity to maintain affordability still exists. On our second map, uh, you'll see the locations and concentrations of land bank properties around Columbus. Land bank properties are ex extremely affordable option for acquiring land or homes into a CLT portfolio. This map shows a concentration of opportunity in the neighborhoods of Linden, Franklinton, Hilltop, and the South Side. The third map that you're going to be looking at is uh, a map of tax delinquency. Uh, we see a concentration of tax delinquent properties in Old North Columbus, Franklinton, Hilltop, and the South Side. This suggests that these areas have low-income homeowners struggling to pay property taxes and are, are at risk of losing their homes, as well as landlords that are similarly struggling uh, to keep up with the payments for the homes they hold as rentals or perhaps are neglectful um, and absentee. Either way, these areas suggest a need for affordability as well as areas where properties that may soon be available to be acquired at a lower cost. And the final map that you're going to take a look at here is uh, a map showing the percentage of uh, households within the 80 to 120 percent AMI uh, price range or income range. Um, this is the initial target from our understanding of Columbus's CLT. 
this, the highest concentrations of this 80 to 120 percent AMI range uh, are focused on the west side, the south side, and an area on, on northeast around uh, the eastern area. Uh, when paired with the previous maps, this lays a foundation for the need of a citywide CLT. Uh, the basics of how a community land trust functions are relatively similar regardless of regional, citywide, or neighborhood scope. However, the approach, this approach has some key distinctions. Typically, a citywide community land trust boundaries will align with the boundaries of the city itself, and there will be some initial level of uh, city involvement or perpetual involvement from the city. Uh, Chris is now going to review the citywide land trust uh, case studies and other findings. Alrighty, so next I'm going to describe the case studies that we selected, the criteria that we use to evaluate these cases, the key takeaways and the strengths and weaknesses of this model based on our research. Case studies that we selected were Chicago, Houston, Nashville, and Seattle. Um, in our selection, we attempted to pick cities with a similar geographic and demographic, demographic scope as Columbus. These cities also have all identified a large need for, for affordable housing units, just as Columbus has. The criteria that we use to evaluate these cases um, are on one of the slides here. Those criteria were operations and management, land and housing strategy, financing, and then again, strengths and weaknesses. So one of the key takeaways from our case studies is the difference between the two uh, land acquisition and ownership models. The traditional land trust model is where the CLT buys the land or receives the land to be put into the, to the land trust. Once purchased, the CLT is able to build new homes or rehab existing homes and sell them at an affordable price. This affordability is usually maintained through a 99-year ground lease. All of our case studies followed this acquisition and ownership model with the exception of, exception of Chicago. Chicago's approach was a little bit different. Their CLT was born out of the passage of, a, of an affordable housing ordinance that requires a certain percentage of new, newly developed for sale units to be sold at an affordable price. In this scenario, the CLT does not own the unit or the land, the developer and then the individual buyer owns the property. These units retain their affordability via a deed restriction requiring that the unit be sold at an affordable price as time goes on. This model allows for affordable units to be added to the CLT um, throughout the city um, as new development comes in rather than targeting specific neighborhoods. So next we're gonna just hit um, briefly on some of the overall strengths and weaknesses that we found with, with this model. Um, so under organization and management, we found um, reduced overhead and redundancy, um, centralized leadership and resources and standardization were all listed as strengths. So we believe that running the CLT at the citywide level would eliminate the need um, to start up individual CLTs throughout, maybe on the neighborhood le level, which could, be, which could be costly both financially and administratively. The second set of strengths that we had listed were under growth management. Those were flexibility to expand and shift focus, flexibility in development pattern, and scalability. So we think um, running the CLT at the citywide le level would um, there would be more flexibility running it that way because there are other tools that can be used by the city um, to complement the CLT, such as an affordable housing ordinance or through uh, CRA affordability requirements. And then some of the weaknesses um, of the CLT model that we identified, um, whether there could be conflicting or competing neighborhood interests, potential isolation of CLT residents in neighborhoods, and then citywide um, CLT policies may not address the, um, the unique needs um, that neighborhoods in Columbus have. And then next, uh, Stephanie's gonna go over um, some of our other our takeaways. Thanks, Chris. So as a result of the research conducted through the case studies, um, we have come up with a sequential set of action items um, that would uh, need to be done in the creation of a citywide CLT. Um, and the first one would be engaging the community. Uh, neighborhood participation will be an integral part in the startup and the growth of the citywide CLT. Uh, and this is a perfect way to partner with lo local organizations um, and then also to market to local residents uh, to join the CLT. Next is performing needs assessments. We think that the city of Columbus has done a wonderful job of um, getting uh, places like Ohio State um, to do research and needs assessments on needs of the Columbus residents, but we think that um, there could 
continuously be more, and that could be a part of the growth strategy as well. Um, and as a result, um, we think that we've identified some tipping point neighborhoods such as Franklinton, uh, as well as areas that are in need of preserving affordability such as the neighborhood of Linden. And then also for future growth could be the potential neighborhoods where affordability could be introduced. Um, and the, these needs can help the CLT change um, its goals over time to meet the changing needs of residents in Columbus. Next is the uh, to set context specific goals. So what we're doing today is giving you a framework and a foundation for a CLT, but we need to bring it back to Columbus. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the city of Columbus and their residents that can set uh, specific goals for the CLT. We think that it's very important to um, understand and to take advantage of Columbus's strong civic associations and area commissions, as well as the Department of Neighborhoods. Uh, and then also to be cognizant of the change from at-large to district-based uh, city council representation and to take advantage of that change. Uh, next is the uh, to create a land acquisition and ownership model. So this is what Chris was talking about, the difference between land lease, like the 99-year land lease, deed restrictions, and an ordinance or some combination of those, uh, which we believe would be advantageous if you did a combination. Uh, and understanding the funding strategies, uh, we understand that there's a um, connection with the land bank properties. We think that's a really great uh, partnership there. Also uh, looking to local financial institutions such as Huntington Bank um, and then also coordinating with other city departments and using traditional affordable housing uh, funding strategies. Uh, donated land from developers um, in exchange for tax breaks, density bonuses or other things that we've seen that cities have done. Um, as well as uh, we saw in our Nashville case study, they budgeted $250,000 a year um, in city money for operational costs, so that puts a good number. And Nashville is a very similar uh, in size and uh, demographics as Columbus. Uh, and uh, next we uh, look at taxes. Um, this is another partnership with the county. We need to understand how we're assessing property values, um, how the taxing is gonna work. Is the owner of the home going to be required to pay all of the taxes? Is it gonna be split? Uh, that needs to be considered um, in this step. And then next is developing focus areas. Uh, as we've mentioned, focusing on Franklinton and Linden. Um, and we think that this is a great part um, for the Department of Neighborhoods to be involved. Uh, next is determining organizational structure. Uh, so this could be 100% city run, it could be 100% private, some combination of the two, nonprofit, for profit. These are all options that we've seen. Uh, but we, be we believe that. Um, it would be advantageous to have um, a non three-part nonprofit board structure. It's one thing that we've seen across a lot of uh, citywide structures, and that is uh, one-third experts uh, in the area or in um, this in home ownership, um, one-third community organizers, and one-third um, eventually would be residents of the CLT. Next is establishing a growth strategy. This is really important for the success of and continuation of the CLT is to understand and have a really realistic growth strategy. So this is um, understanding um, how many units are you gonna add per year um, and what are your funding availability? How is that gonna change? Could you eventually turn into a self-sustaining uh, program, which would be absolutely wonderful. Um, we believe that we can bring in the newly created community reinvestment areas and the newly created um, legislation around that by gr growing um, units at an affordable um, rate to the CLT. And then also um, understanding how it's going to change over time. So we believe that you could start with maybe the 80 to 120 percent AMI, but could you increase that range? Could you create new products that could be affordable to different individuals? Um, understanding that we need to avoid neighborhood saturation, saturation um, by changing your focus, um, and then potentially if, um, introducing affordability to neighborhoods such as Sherman Village and Clintonville. And finally, we think it's important to incorporate pro programming other than just buying and selling homes. Um, you want to surround individuals in this CLT with um, services such as financial education, foreclosure prevention, um, other service provision that's typical in affordable housing models, um, as well as understanding how you're going to do maintenance, who's going to, ma to maintain these homes, and then um, eventually do property improvements. 
And finally, bringing it all home, um, we believe that community land trusts, um, we've seen that community land trusts very widely. Um, we see that a lot of smaller neighborhood-based nonprofits um, are limited in scope and resources. And then on the flip side, regional CLTs um, may have a lot of resources, but they, um, it's hard for them to ensure the equitable distribution of those resources to households who need them the most. Um, and so uh, regional CLTs also are too large in scope to make targeted and lasting impacts in communities. With the affordable housing crisis in Columbus, um, the multifaceted approach is warranted. And then this, the capacity and adaptability of a citywide community land trust um, would help reduce the um, 54,000 unit gap in affordable housing um, while preserving that affordability for generations to come. The purpose of um, our research was to provide you guys with a foundation and a framework of the house. And now it's your to uh, put in the insulation, the walls, the paint, and do the finishing touches on this home um, to ensure affordability to come. Questions? Thank you so much. Um, this is actually, I really appreciated your, your presentation. One question that, that I um, have, since you studied several cities that have uh, been doing this from as far back as 1992, um, how do changing housing markets affect community land trust? And is there a um, value to a citywide uh, land trust in uh, to absorb the changing housing markets versus a neighborhood um, in terms of like scalability and, and, and sustainability? Um, have, have any of these had real issues with Changing markets, and the the answer may be I don't mean Seattle might have been on a progressing housing market ever since 1992, but I'm assuming you know we go through um, starts and stops, and, and the economy changes. So just be interested to understand that. So um, one one thing we found about that was interesting about Chicago. So like I said, they passed a, a citywide ordinance requiring affordability with new development. So one of the strengths that they said. Um, came out of that as they were able to place affordable units throughout the city and not just in specific neighborhoods. So as development patterns did change in the neighborhood, so if you know development started happening in more development started happening in like Linden, for instance, that affordability affordability ordinance would also apply to them. So I'll also apply to that area so it would grow um, as the city grows as well. Now one drawback to that they found was just operating based off the ordinance was kind of limiting. Um, because the the CLT was only able to add in new 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 units when new development came in, so if development did straggle a little bit, like in 2008 with the housing crisis, um, they said that that really slowed things down. They only, if you guys noticed, they only had um, they only have 96 or 98 units in their um, CLT, which is kind of a small number, um, and they said that they haven't been able to they haven't been able to get the funding needed to expand to purchase units. Um, so like purchase, purchase different units or purchase single family homes, um, which is something they recommended to us to recommend to you, would be, a, would be a good option to have. Not limit yourself on what you can do. So. Yeah, and um, that's a great point, is that the, one of the strengths is the flexibility to change as the markets change and to understand, to build in in your growth strategy, um, maybe checkpoints and, and ability um, of the CLT to change and grow as the chain, as the markets change, um, but also hopefully the goal would be that we would stabilize some of those changes too, that in some of those neighborhoods that we're working that there wouldn't be such drastic changes in the market. Um, and so that would allow for affordability to stay there. So thank you guys for the presentation. You mentioned you've given us a framework and now we need to look at insulation and fixtures. Those cost money. Uh, curious with the other case studies, how much investment the cities are making to do a citywide CLT. I know you mentioned Nashville's 250 in the operating budget. Uh, Chicago apparently doesn't have the funding that they desire uh, to meet their housing gap. Um, it's something we struggle with as we look at our affordable housing gap in the city of Columbus. So curious what kind of range of dollars the cities were investing in the CLTs, or you also mentioned, someone mentioned self-sustaining, what kind of support cities providing or what their budgets are to be self-sustaining. So, like we mentioned, Nashville, we had a pretty solid number, um, and Chicago didn't have any um, support 
and monetarily from the city. Um, and Houston um, mentioned that they had some startup funds. Um, I think that's probably the most important piece of the funding is the startup. Um, and then they actually uh, assumed um, they haven't started, they haven't gotten to this point, but they're assuming that it will become self-sustaining um, in the long run. Yeah, I would also say that um, obviously finding affordable options um, for the city up front is going to be advantageous if you do have limited funds. Um, so partnering perhaps with the uh, community or the land bank um, would be a great partnership that um, or finding ways to acquire donated lands through, you know, developer incentives or things like that can provide um, can provide the properties, can provide the land, even when funds initially may be, uh, may be limited. Seattle is the city that's had a um, CLT for since 1992. The others, like, are. So, can you talk a little bit about the the, the number of units uh, that Seattle has, and if it was if the city did provide you know startup dollars for them? It's around 200 units, but I know that um, it was started from a grass, grassroots. Yeah, 200. Sorry, yeah, 200. Um, it was started from grassroots origin in 1992, but its first unit wasn't um, started until 2002, I believe, at the first unit purchased. In any of the models that you um, looked at, are they starting to consider a rental product at all um, for those who may never be mortgage ready? And when you start talking about displacement, um, coming up with a solution to keep people as renters in these areas that are now you know, experiencing the higher market rates for home, home ownership and rentals? Um, so Chicago, part of their CL, it's not, the units aren't necessarily in the CLT yet, but they do offer other rental assistance programs um, in the city housing department that they, um, we briefly researched. Um, but yes, they've, they've started looking at offering options and um, on the rental, rental side as well. I think as it grows, um, you can change focus and really wrap a community comprehensively with all development there. Um, we think home ownership might be the place to start. Um, and then as the capacity grows of the CLT, moving to renters, um, also moving to commercial retail um, would be advantageous. And if you wrap developers in, uh, then having those developers as um, built, sort of as an extra to your capacity um, as maybe they're the owners of the apartment building and they um, understand the rental and maybe using some of the more traditional affordable housing methods that are really advantageous for renting um, and wrapping those into the CLT. But a lot, I think all of our, um, all of our case studies started with home ownership. Um, Houston said that they mentioned that they will eventually move to renters, um, but it's all starting with home ownership. This is a pretty basic question, but when when a homeowner in a CLT do they get the equity from the, the sale? Yeah, so different models um, do this differently, but from what we've seen, um, the CLT limits the amount of equity that they can um, have. And so there's also, uh, you can do different models that the homeowner gets all of the equity at the limited amount, or they maybe split it with the CLT and the homeowner, so that that CLT, that could be a force of um, a space for funding there. Um, but it, it's definitely limited because if you, if you limit it completely, then it's sort of disincentivizing um, home ownership. But if you allow for some equity there, you can um, help those individuals and still keep it affordable. Any more questions from the panel? All right, well, thank you, uh, city team. And last but certainly not least, our regional community land trust presentation.
Hello? So, um, so why per to increase in supply. Um, as far as a scale for a regional model, we are recommending the Franklin. So looking at pro Complexity of making Getting started.
Oh, wait, so, excuse me. <laughs> um, as we said, the zones, we didn't want to uh, decide them for you, but other examples have used existing zones and boundaries of municipalities or school districts, which are usually the same, um, but they've also been data-oriented to decide uh, where to go in the county and um, who deserves it, not deserves it the most, but the biggest opportunity zones. And then uh, there's also fe federal designations. And we have found this is, uh, these are called opportunity zones. And this is actually spurred from the newest tax bill that the state of Ohio selected these census tracts in Franklin County that are the most low income and poverty stricken. Um, and as you see, they're not all in the city core of Columbus. Um, they spread throughout. They're actually, as you can see, they're, it is obviously centralized, but there are still many in the south, southwest, and stretching up to the north, um, which is really important with the county land trust because you don't want that divide of thinking urban, suburban, urban, suburban, rural, and everyone thinking that they didn't get um, a fair shot. Um, and then maintaining affordability. Um, there is an option that we found in Sonoma County's uh, land trust where developers are required to have X amount of affordable units when they build, but if they are unwilling to do that, they can pay into a fund for the land trust, so then the land trust gains more money that way. And then, as Isabel stated, the housing types switch are changing throughout the years, and it could be anything by 2050, but obviously you want to focus on single-family attached, single-family detached, and multifamily homes. So looking at the sale process, um, as far as qualifications, you want to base it on area median income. It's also worth it to include workforce housing and just be sure that it's all data oriented. Consider income levels, the existing housing stock and market projections. If you look at the charts, um, the extremely low income limit for three people at 30% AMI is $20,160, so very low. Um, in the bottom chart, it is worth noting that the net supply of affordable units for very low income renters is meeting demand overall, but the net supply of affordable units for extremely low income renters is not meeting demand, not even close. Um, so as far as looking at forgiveness, recapture, or retention models, we recommend a subsidy recapture where part or all of the subsidy is recaptured by the program for the future. And this model works best in moderate markets, moderate investments, and moderate capacities overall. Now looking forward, moving forward. <laughs> Um, our key takeaways is the benefits of regionally scaled CLT, as we've said before. Franklin County, City of Columbus, all the municipalities work really well together. Um, so that's a benefit that a lot of counties do not have. Um, Columbus obviously is booming, so there's different types of stakeholders you can get to. And also at the county level, there's, like we said before, there's so many areas that you can attack to uh, help solve this problem that we have throughout Franklin County. And then the City of Columbus potential involvement, as we have up there on our slides, um, obviously they would help with the acquisition. The feasibility, especially you could find certain lots that if they aren't sized correctly, the, there can be things that can solve that. Um, the seed money, as we said before, you can gain that through stakeholders. The uh, Franklin County uh, often receives the federal funds and they're the ones that dole it out. Um, so they would be an important partner to have. And then obviously you would provide leadership as we have a picture from uh, a Marvel movie and wanted to point out that city council is Captain America because they're leading the charge. <laughs> um, so any questions? Thank you, regional group. And we apologize for the uh, microphone delay. We were able to hear you um, uh, very well. So thank you. I'm gonna open up for questions from my colleagues or panelists. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, just trying to wrap my head around kind of the county concept. When you've got uh, an area like City of Columbus and, and looking at some of the other case studies, 
how you bring all those different partners. The needs of a Bexley are very different than the needs of a Columbus. The needs of Worthington, very different than Obets. Um, county, yes, can kind of do that position, which we heard a little bit with the city, that it's not just concentrated in one area, uh, but what the affordable housing needs are, Bexley, again, very different than Reynoldsburg. And so how do you suggest the leadership balance that out? I know you kind of provided a zone staffing model, uh, but won't they be competing at different levels? And, and I'll tell you, we see a little bit of that with our land bank at some areas. Uh, yes, there's pockets in the city of Columbus where neighborhoods you see high uh, land bank, but then as people are trying to turn it over, there is that competition for dollars or those investments. Um. The way we organize it, or we believe it's organized from the case studies, is that you would want to hit the areas that need it the most. And obviously, like we've already discussed, like you said, Worthington, Bexley are going to have totally different needs, whereas Franklinton is going to have totally different needs than Worthington as well. So it's, it's going to become a difficult uh, line to toe. And from our other case studies, what they found is that, like we said, we, you need to go for the areas that need it the most first, um, but to not avoid uh, problems that are uh, starting up in Bexley or Worthington or Upper Arlington, et cetera, because throughout the years, the suburbs um, will also be facing these troubles as well. In the Sonoma County mix and match. In areas where developers weren't incentivized, they were able to use a neighborhood level or city level, like our, our classmates explained, those types of strategies where they're actually acquired. They worked on like developments, not necessarily a neighborhood scale or city scale, but working with developers within their total development or when they were working in a more traditional community, community land trust model, working, kind of creating their own development, so capturing five, six parcels at a time and working on that level. So they were able to match those strategies um, to where the market was already doing well and trying to capture some afford, keep affordability there, um, and then act, going after areas that needed those affordable homes. I, I appreciate uh, on, on your third slide, um, you taking a look at the future housing needs of our region. Um, and uh, over the next 30 years, it's, we're gonna need, uh, some looks like about 55% more attached homes. Um, could you talk about um, using community land trust to solve for the larger um, housing needs of the future over the next 30 years as we add these new people to the community? It's more of an abstract question, but um, could, could someone speak to that? It might not even be just this team. Um, well, part of the study that was done that talked about the I was talking about how the existing housing market is not gonna serve the demand, the needs that are coming. So, um, in an abstract way, thinking about how community land, land trust model can address this, um, what there's gonna be an overabundance of is single family housing. Um, so working with stakeholders to develop a strategy, maybe it's acquiring parcels and splitting with zoning, make sure that they're able to be adapted. Um, maybe the strategy, not necessarily the regional level, would be the best way to do that and work better on the city or community level um, so that you could general question that could be addressed to any group. I, it seems like you spent time like focusing on your specific land trust. Are there any changes of heart like from one group that you think a better, a different model would be better suited for Columbus? Um, just through our case studies, not all of them, but they, I mean, I still obviously support this one, but most of them are <laughs> rural counties. 
um, we found because um, people are more spread out. Um, an example was Center County where um, Penn State is located. It's actually twice the size of Franklin County with probably about a quarter of the population of uh, Franklin County. And they've had their land trust, I think, since 96, 97, and it's going strong. Um, so it kind of works in more rural area, um, but it can obviously work in Columbus and Franklin County because it, um, everybody works together a little bit better here. I think, I mean, in our proposal that we had, we think that a neighborhood and city level, like hybrid would work best for Columbus because there is strong individual like neighborhood, um, neighborhoods that need to be empowered to have their own community land trust, but there needs to be some type of um, overarching city involvement that is kind of overall of that, whether having it be mainly city based and then you know, different neighborhoods that are uh, working for the city or if it's different neighborhood level community land trust that has a city oversight. I think that's kind of ambiguous in terms of which one you can buy, but having neighborhood and city level combined, I, we think would be the best um, model that, that would work with on this. We think um, we were all very uh, passionate coming into the citywide, and I think a lot of our research confirmed our assumptions on the citywide, um, especially the only, the only hesitation um, is to say that there weren't a lot of examples. A lot of cities aren't doing it this way. Um, and that would be the only thing that I would say is, was our struggle in this. But we continuously saw looking at the city of Columbus and our structure and um, support from the council and the mayor's office. And um, we, we really think that it would be great. I think having partners at the local level and at the regional level um, to complement it would be wonderful as well. Would, um, would each of your groups say that the most important thing that we could do right now is to purchase land? Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> because we really can't do anything else without having a real plan to purchase land. And from that point, certainly having a broad understanding of each of the different um, um, shared for the for state, whether regional, neighborhood, or city. But I, um, so I wanted to make sure that we were, everyone's in agreement that we certainly cannot do anything and that our number one focus really needs to be that if we are going to go down this path, the path to only get to more affordable housing is we have to become very strategic about our land and thinking about what's currently even in the land bank before it goes to someone else just to be um, just laser focused on it and then we can figure out which is really going to be I think our best our best solution as you just mentioned there's neighborhoods already that are already um, which you could have bought land pretty inexpensively that now it's not you know we're, we're being housed out of that market you know, the price of that market so we got to now think about how do we start thinking about that plan as we are moving forward as a city. And I think in every city that I've gone to and talked about the same topic, it is about get the land, get the land. So thank you. If I can just say one thing to that, the pattern of land acquisition, um, regardless of model, I think something that our group found was that um, being sensitive to the density uh, within an area that you are purchasing properties to be dedicated to a CLT, um, is very important, so are you buying up an entire block and or developing an entire block and that whole block is a CLT or are you perhaps purchasing five homes on a block and spreading that out so that it's a little bit more of a clustering but not an entire uh, oversaturation of one block where maybe there's a little bit of, uh, where you can see a clear divide of those are the community land trust properties and these are the market properties. Um, so avoiding that and avoiding some of the oversaturation. Well, on behalf of my colleagues, I just want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank the professors, uh, Dr. Reese and Dr. Hanlon, for um, obviously the deep dive that you guys provided today. Uh, as policymakers, uh, we need this uh, influx of information to help us um, 
make decisions, but also plan for the future. This is a, a future conversation. Our community is growing, as this last slide shows. We're going to add a million people to this region over the next 25 years. Uh, and one of the issues that will limit what kind of city we look like is if there is affordable housing, if everybody can partake and be a part of that. And so I hope that each and every one of you see yourselves as part of the solution that, from, that whatever we do from today on, there was a foundation based off of the work that you individually have done and provided to us. Uh, and for that, I'm very grateful. I want to, uh, I'm gonna give the last remarks to Ms. Kinder, uh, Kingsborough um, from COSIC uh, because I know that there is some really good work happening as we speak and I would just like to um, have her close out, but I wanna thank the, the team, uh, our council team that worked on this, Andrew Dyer, uh, thank you so much for pulling this together. Rolanda Hampton, uh, Council Member Page, Chair Page of the Housing Committee for uh, putting her weight behind this discussion. Also on the administration side, uh, Director, Deputy Director Hannah Jones and Assistant Director Hannah Reed as well as uh, Zach Davidson on my team and CTV for filming today's presentation. Again, thank you to um, Dr. Reese, uh, Dr. Hanlon, for, for your support um, and, and partnership. With that, I'm going to turn to close us out. Thank you. So um, the, city, the City of Columbus Land Bank and the Franklin County Land Bank are co-located. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but we've been working hand in hand the last five years demolishing blighted, tax delinquent, abandoned properties throughout these areas that you studied. And so right now, the land banks do own, have acquired and own several, more than several lots throughout these areas that you've studied. So um, we are pausing for a moment before we sell those to private developers for market rate housing. We want to think very much about a trust and the benefits of being strategic with these lots that are now in areas that are past tipping point, but are definitely um, market rate at this point. So we want to preserve affordable housing um, permanently, and we're looking at ways to protect the city and county's investments going forward so that we can have a sustained subsidy plan throughout first homeowner, but all the uh, homeowners to come. With all the things that we're facing with the lack of affordable housing already, we really need to take a, a strong look at what we're, our procedures and what we're doing. So we are working to come up with a recommendation between the, um, the city and county on, on a possible plan that we think will work, um, keeping um, the public investment, protecting home ownership long term, and um, also looking at the rental piece because we also know that displacement is not only about people who can't purchase a home, it's all because they can. And so um, a lot of that's already going on. So this has been really great to listen to what we've um, looked at from all the um, county trust, uh, land trust um, nationwide.